in our uh, digital panel. Uh, we're going to look at the impact of streaming. Uh, my name is Andrew Hamlin. I'm uh, very pleased and honored to be here as your moderator today uh, and having uh, such a distinguished panel. Uh, let me go through and introduce them. Uh, we'll start at the uh, far side there. Alison Al from Toronto, uh, and of course a uh, award-winning uh, saxophone player here performing at the uh, festival this week, and we're very pleased to have her. Um, so welcome, Alison. Uh, and then we have Cody Hutchinson uh, from the West Coast, or not quite West Coast, Calgary. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Past Toronto, let's just leave it at that. Um, who is a very active musician, of course, as well. Uh, and also uh, a radio show, uh, record label uh, manager, uh, bringing a lot of experience uh, about uh, his uh, work in the jazz environment as well. Welcome, Cody. Uh, Rosie Monday from Toronto, uh, who is uh, a great artist in herself uh, and has been working with uh, some really great bands, uh, especially in the, uh, the newer electronic environment, going to bring a lot of experience uh, when it comes to maybe some of the, uh, uh, the more contemporary side of the, uh, the industry as well. So welcome, Rosie. Uh, and uh, Jason Bissazer from Montreal, uh, a record label manager. Uh, and uh, uh, a booker for venues, going to uh, understand how we can look at some of these technologies uh, in um, getting audiences out to, uh, to venues. So with that, uh, again, our session today is going to look maybe more at the realities of the world uh, when we look at the digital streaming environment. We are in a digital environment. When we came to this venue, maybe we booked that through an Uber. We might be staying at an Airbnb. All of these types of applications drive the end customer, who is who pays for these services, who pays taxes for these types of services, to the digital environment. Whether they stream music, whether they watch something on Netflix, it becomes part of the very essence of uh, people today, and not just young people, uh, all ranges of our, uh, of our uh, um, industry. So we need to understand how we can reach out and engage those people. We started off this week talking about the media. Uh, we talked recently about how we can use it, uh, technology in creating the music, but how can we use technology as a revenue stream and how we can use technology in order to drive revenue from different sources at the same time. So we'll try and look at some of those uh, different sessions. We'll have time at the end for questions, so please do think of your questions, pose those to the panel as a whole, or if you have a specific question to a panelist, that's absolutely fine as well. We'll do that towards the, uh, uh, maybe in uh, 35 minutes or so. So one thing that we have to realize here is at the very introduction of our week on Thursday, Simon Bro uh, of the uh, uh, Canada Council for the Arts made a statement that nostalgia is not a plan. And I think that that's a very important phrase, we have to understand that any genre of music can have an idea of how we want to uh, change our audience, how we want to inform our audience, but we're also part of that stream that we have to be taken up on. So we are going to have to adapt to how our audience engages with us, and we can't always dictate how we engage with the audience. So we'll be looking at how streaming can look at that. So I think some of the numbers, I think it's no surprise to anyone to realize that streaming is now the primary method. It now takes into account, um, it's our number here, uh, uh, a huge amount of 46% of our global market of media, of revenue for music comes from streaming revenue. Now that does not in any way mean that that gets to the artist, so that's one of the questions I'm going to have for the panel here is, how do we get a larger piece of that pie? And we have to understand that the growing media here is streaming. 39% year-on-year growth for revenue from streaming. So it's a market that we have to be behind. And we know for a fact that the other medias generally in decline, with the exception of LPs, which is, of course, picking up maybe cassettes as well, but a very small percentage of this. So globally, According to uh, our industry, 230 million people subscribe to a paid streaming service. 
So we only need a small percentage of those numbers in order to bring up some revenue. So my first question to the panel here is streaming. How are we going to embrace it? Just in a quick introduction here. You want to go ahead, uh, Jason? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, streaming has been around now for a couple of years. Maybe I'd say in Canada it started out with what I believe these are. So it's been around for like eight years or so. And uh, it's been growing ever since, and it's mattering more and more. And we, there's a great team, there's great teams for Apple Music in Toronto, for Spotify, for Google Play, for YouTube, that are all about um, pushing out Canadian artists uh, nationally and worldwide. So um, I think it's uh, very possible to do well on there for, um, for anybody that um, has a project that people are excited about. Um, I think you get something key, Jason, is that for people that are excited about it, so um, what streaming has allowed me to do is be more aware of my analytics. So who's listening to my music, where, uh, the demographic, so I can target those people who are already listening and generate interest or work with where the interest already lies. So. That's one way of embracing streaming. Well, I've, uh, I've been to all the other panels here, and, and there's been a, a small thread I've, I've noticed in certain uh, corners where it's the sky is falling. And uh, the sky's always been falling. The player piano was invented, I'm sure. Everyone's like, no one's going to play piano again. Um, you know, CDs are, oh no, that's, you know, eight track takes, cassettes. All these different things keep developing. It's developing. But the reality is there's more people on Earth than ever. Uh, streaming is what is happening. It is how music is shifting. The industry is, is not dying. It's moving. And the numbers show that. So it's embracing the fact, which I, I enjoyed the previous panel where we're talking about you know, technology and your music. It's just understanding. That's where it's going. You know, we're no longer on horses. We're in cars. Uh, now we can fly. Now this is this is what's what's happening with the music industry. What to me is important with this is uh, when we talk about being in a creative art form like jazz. It's also being creative in how we approach and think about the new model. Um, I'll, I'll just tell like a completely random story on this. When I was a, a younger player, I remember playing with a, a drummer who was you know at the time I was like 19, 20. He was in his 50s, and. Uh, and we play, and he's like, oh, you sound great. That's nice playing with you. And I go, oh, thanks so much. He's like, where'd you go to school? And I was like, well, I got a business degree. And his response was immediate. Why the hell are you a musician? When I was your age, I made as much as a doctor. And I'm like, and I, and I thought about something Ernesto Cervini said yesterday. He's like, well, this is my reality. I'm coming up knowing I'm going to have this much work. And this is the, the choice to be a musician. Streaming is the same kind of thing. You know, there's an old paradigm of you go, you make albums and you make music to become, you know, to pay for themselves or to make money. And in certain genres, that's there's still a possibility. But I, quite honestly, in jazz, I don't think that's ever really been the case. When you hear like, you know, a Grammy-winning artist like Esperanza Spalding, her second album sold 15,000 units. Right, things like that. It's it's not so much about that. It's putting out the art. So it's just being creative and thoughtful about, okay, streaming is here. How do I embrace this in a way that enhances my career and my goals? So that's it. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't want to date myself. I'm going to date myself. Um, I think I'm of the generation that has never seen the benefits of um, selling albums ever. Um, I've never... I mean, it's just not in my reality. So I don't know of my peer group who has actually sold uh, units in that way. So for me, streaming is, um, I've just always embraced it. And to me, it's more of like a business card to get uh, live performances and to book myself um, uh, on tours and stuff. So um, I've used streaming to help facilitate uh, the live show. And that's where I've been uh, making more of a revenue in that, that way. So streaming is more of, um, yeah, it's just like a business card for me, and it's it's been really valuable to me, as well to be able to access listeners that might not otherwise have have listened to my uh, music because streaming is so accessible internationally. So um, 
Yeah, kind of like what Rosie's saying about analytics. I haven't checked myself what my demographic of listening audience is, but um, you know, occasionally in Bandcamp it says like what country they're from that I you know actually check out. So um, yeah, so it's allowed my music to be listened to other in other countries. So to me, that's a benefit. So it's a necessary part of yes. being an artist today. Yes. Uh, and do you see specific um, people coming? I mean, do people come more? Come, people come to concerts, or they come and say. I heard you online. I mean, is there a tangible? Somewhat, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I would say so. I would say so. I think so. Yeah. And what about the other? I mean, have we seen this? Have we seen customers saying, "I'm only booking you if I can hear you," I, uh, or "I'm only going to uh, come along if people <clears throat> see it"? Do we see the change in audiences that way? Well. Um, to be clear, I used to be a booker like 10 years ago, okay. but <laughs> That's okay. I, I still work with bands now um, under um, a label, I guess. But um, I mean, there's both ways, and I think it all comes back to like having people excited about your music. There's a great punk label out of New York called, I think it's they're called Toxic State or something like that, and they don't have any of their catalog on streaming services, and a bunch of their bands can tour anywhere in North America and draw 500 people. So, I mean, they have a scene, I mean, they have their circuit, they, they know where to go, and people are excited about their bands. On the other hand, you have streaming, like, I mean, streaming successes, if you want, that, like, bands that kind of started from nowhere, and then they get placed on big playlists, and then, in a, like, a year later, they have, like, 20 million streams, and then they could go out on tour, and they get booked on festivals. So, like, there's no real way, like, the, I think, you could get people excited about your project without having like monster numbers and still go out on tour. Um, so I think everything is possible. So. Uh, I agree. It really comes down to the community that you're serving or being in tune with who's listening to your music. Because you, you're never going to replace the one on one human connection. Like coming out here. I found an open mic that was going on and I went and I performed there. I knew about the open mic because I had seen them online and people who go to that show were interacting with my stuff online. So nothing beats the one on one human connection. I feel like it's the need is there's a need to, for them to flow with each other seamlessly because it's a tool at the end of the day and yeah, it might be a little bit uncomfortable if you're not familiar with its usage, but you can learn. Like the, I think the brain is the only muscle that doesn't stop growing or doesn't stop. Uh, you know? Yeah, that's what we, we got to use it to know it to see. But um, it's just yeah, it's a tool. So and nothing beats uh, getting on the ground and engaging with people. Like I'm pretty sure that's the reason why. That punk band or that label um, can tour, and they're not online, but they're in the real world. Mm -hmm. yeah. you they're know? just selling LPs like off Bandcamp, and that's their business, really. And, and distribution. The, and that's understanding market too, right? That's yeah. from a label side, understanding there are people out there that are functioning in a different way, seeing the world differently, and want to experience differently. The analytics side of the now streaming is actually a huge opportunity for artists in the sense where you can honestly see where your audience is, where, you know, which area scenes, and then you can, this is where you see people focusing their, their ad buys online and that type of thing, and, and considering the amount of costs to do ads now, artists, it's, it's a real thing that you can, you can do to supplement uh, what you're doing, but to me it's always about um, capacity and, and just forethought on, on the, the behalf of an artist. So, you know, this this is always the struggle as artists is, you know, how much can I do while still remaining true to my art? So we all can't become social media experts, we all can't become analytics experts, but we can all try and uh, find people that believe in us that could help us out on that, that side of things. But the, the analytics side now, it's, it's growing and growing and growing, and you can start targeting um, different ways, like uh, through through our label. So the label, my label I have out of the West, it represents Western Canadian artists. We've got about 85 albums out. And our whole thing is is trying to create export-ready artists. 
Um, it's not about us making a mint on albums. What it is is creating a legitimate uh, structure for these artists to find their way onto the stages to the crowds that they want to, to meet. And we've been fairly successful in that. But we've also realized um, what capacity do we have. Streaming is a whole new thing. There are people who are uh, developing an expertise in there. And if you can find them and you can get them on board, uh, that is a, it's a huge, huge benefit to an artist. And you can find out, you know, hey, I didn't realize this. And we had, a, we had an artist, this was the case. He didn't realize um, his audience was Germany. We thought it was going to be like southern U.S., Americana. And it ended up that he had a huge audience in Germany. And his career touring out in Europe now is strictly based off of Spotify metrics. That we, dis we discovered, wow, okay, that's where you need to go. Let's try it. And it's very successful. So it's changed the requirement that maybe an artist has of their agent or label or brand to <coughs> not understand those things. It becomes a well, we talked we talk about, you know, there's, there's the loss of revenue for, for, for smaller artists, but then there are some benefits in the sense of now, yeah, you see, you, you can be more uh, directive in what you're doing. You can be more focused in where you're going, what you're doing. Um, you can see how your music is, is like even just where it's in playlists. You know, how you're describe, self-describing your music, you're trying to get it into playlists, dealing with curators. I know it's more algorithms now, but there are still, as you mentioned, there's a great team in Toronto for Apple Music and things like that, where there are still human beings with hands-on who can push like, and, and that's another whole relationship thing, is trying to get, get to some of these people in a different way to have them pushing music into the right spots. You know, getting onto a curated pl playlist on Spotify, for example, you're gonna, it's not gonna hurt your, your uh, ability to, to do what you want as an artist. Well, maybe, who knows. Depends on the list, I'm sure. Depends on the list. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, just to add to that, I think that's where um, the organic side is really, really important. So it, it goes back to the good old good old days of just recording a good album, like having nice artwork, nice press pictures, a good bio, playing shows, hiring a publicist, having reviews, and like if your career is trending the right way, um, you'll fall on these people's ears. You know, they'll find out about you on CBC or Exclaim or something. You know, so it's just basically building, and then having those organic plays uh, can really benefit you because. If you're having a fair amount of plays and you're not in their big playlists, then that, that means there's really people going to your profile and listening, and that counts for a lot. And it's going to trigger the algorithm and just get get you more plays, you know. And then when you have another release down the line, well, you'll have that track record, and then you might get some support. And, and if I can add just to that, um, just talking to one of the panelists on the last was the idea, which a lot of artists don't do, musicians don't do this that well, and they, they really should think more about it, is taking yourself out of the equation and just writing down what, you know, what it is I want to achieve, and then working the problem and, and looking at it like, okay, what are the solutions, and now embracing that technology and saying, how does that fit in to help me with that, so that, okay, great, I want to stay this level as an artist, but I also want to use that to get to here and connect and, and be organic and reach. And you can, you know, organic is, or, you know, we, we say it like, oh, it's just going to happen. Yeah, it can just happen, but you can, you can itemize a plan to make something organic. And I've, I've done it. We've done it. And it's doable. And you just have to sit down and say, okay, this is how I want to achieve this. And look at other people who are doing it. You, it's the easiest thing on earth is watch other people's success. Contact them. What did you do? And you'd be surprised at how smart some of these people are about how they've made that organic thing happen. Um, so our customer out here can call up whatever they want. I can sit in my living room or in my car and say, hey Alexa, and it's going to find what I want. How do we get the market out there to be asking for the right thing? How does a industry a sub-industry like jazz, music, make sure that our end customers can go and ask those questions. Is there a, anyone got any experience of how we could do that, or is that something that you find if you're performing? Do we have to go and remind our audience members? Uh, do we have to do that on social media? How do we drive up that recognition within that Spotify list, or, or whatever it might be? 
Well, there's there's a question first of being like first in terms of like vocal assistance if you say hey play like cool jazz music and then who's going to pop up first you know it's probably not going to be someone you know you know it's probably going to be like some, some legacy type artist that has like a huge catalog so that's maybe far-fetched but i mean there's ways to like just grow your grow your career grow your band or whatever it is you you, you call yourself um and just try to reach that level where you're getting the attention of those streaming services. And it's not as hard as it seems. I know it looks like impossible to reach sometimes, but it's very doable. And I mean, there's ways uh, you have to be patient. You have, um, maybe you need a team, you know, it could be a label or it could be a manager or it could be someone that knows someone, you know, but like you, it, it could be very beneficial to have a conversation with Spotify. How do you have a conversation with Spotify? Well, maybe you meet them at one of these conventions. Maybe, um, maybe you 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 sign to a label and and share your profits uh, in in the hope of getting on those lists. And then your revenue will triple. And then sharing that revenue maybe doesn't look that bad. Or maybe you could there's like distributors like A Wall or The Orchard or people like Believe that just basically take like a percentage of your catalog, usually 15%, and they have people in-house that pitch to those services. So there's ways to have your name mentioned in those conversations. And if you as an artist have built your career enough and like have tour dates, reviews, you're playing, like I said, on CBC Sirius or whatever, um, then there's like, it's gonna be interesting for whoever's representing you to be like, hey, this is uh, an artist from Ottawa. This is what they're doing. This is, you know, this is their track record. Can you please listen to this? And I mean, it could work. Uh, it works for us. So <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. Alison, you mentioned that you that you see that in your your um, your concerts, people who are, are using this streaming as a as a knowledge of your environment. So how how did that start? How did we get that get that message out to those who are out from? I don't know. You know, I don't know that exact answer. I think that's pretty complicated. And I think as well as like an independent jazz musician, I think it's like an ongoing conversation as to how to get people to genuinely want to check out your music. Um, for me, my ensemble has benefited from making appearances at larger festivals. Um, that's been a good way for us to get inroads to different, you know, listeners that might not otherwise come across the band. Um, but I think from the perspective of someone like what you're kind of describing, which like just searching online, I think that's something that I have yet to really figure out. Um, but certainly, from my experience, I could see, or I hope to, eventually try to branch out of jazz specific types of presentations and, and presenters too, to try to reach different types of listeners um, in that way. But again, that's just from a performance perspective. I think that to me, that's the main way I've seen that dynamic kind of developing a symbiotic relationship in that way. Um, so I don't know if I can speak to exactly just like the cold search online. That's something I'm still trying to figure out how to reach new listeners. I think it works um, in union with other forms of media, like social media, for example. I spent all of uh, 2019 releasing remixes every Monday and what that did for my engagement and finding new listeners was awesome because people were always given something new which is one thing that i believe streaming has encouraged uh is like the frequency at which people are consuming music and as an artist in my field hip-hop i can meet that demand and benefit from it um people are and and when putting music on line for example is i will do ads and test out um different targets and you see it you see it come back you see the numbers grow you see people engaging then you see that translate in streaming um so that's one way that's been able to work you know and find new listeners online from people searching because they're seeing you, and there's so much online. But um, yeah, that is one way in conjunction with like going to events, meeting people, um, doing shows, meeting folks. 
it all works together really there's no there isn't one way and i think that's something to really recognize with this new model is that it is new and it's exciting for me because literally you can roadmap it and say this is what i want to do and i'm gonna do x y and z i'm gonna talk to this person and that person get insights um it's a lot it's a lot more open is the way i see it and it's um it's what i know you know can do whatever you can you can make it work <laughs> yeah one of our panelists yesterday was talking about the uh, how print media has become ineffective in get reaching out to audiences and at the same time Ernesto said that the first thing when he mentions to his students at University of Toronto about a band in the class they are there searching for it on Spotify and tagging a track or adding it to their own playlist or cue or whatever it might be so that they can review it later so I think that those different uh, those different things about getting that first initial contact is, is maybe the key here. Um, and they talked about the concept of partnership where it's, it's no longer a one-way street, it's a two-way right. street. And that's very true as an artist engaging with your audience. If you are, and th this is kind of like that whole catch-22, how do I get a job without experiences? How do I get followers without this, that, or the other thing? Well, the big deal is as an artist, are you connecting with them when you're live? And, it, and since we're the jazz, uh, festival and, and talking about jazz, that, that's the biggest thing for jazz musicians is do you connect with your audience? And then taking the few small steps to just capitalize on that. And I know that's a terrible word to use, in, like monetize or capitalize, two words are horrible for artists. But the reality is um, if you're in jazz where you're, you're in theoretically what should be a lifelong art, where you're not just going to be, you know, 25 and, you know, pop singer and that's it, you're out. Um, it's, it's a music that, you know, theoretically should be growing and all that. And your audience hopefully grows with you. And that you do make some steps to bring them on board and to come on with the, the voyage. Part of it, too, is consistency. Um, if you, like you were talking about Music Monday, that's consistency. So if you're doing things like that, there's an expectation from your audience that you have a consistency which is driving driving them to consume your music. Uh, so you need to you need to do what's achievable for you. So for example, if it's Music Monday, but you like the type of person who can only do it every three weeks, then then make sure it's every three weeks, not you know, or you can pre-plan that stuff if you're on tour a lot. You know, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll preview some of this stuff and then I can just post it when I'm when I'm rolling that type of thing. If that's that's how you are, but it's it's so about consistency now online because you want to just keep, I guess, feeding the beast, as it were, in a way that is good for you, and then your audience, uh, they're, they're, they, they feel that regular uh, contact, and they feel that they're part of your journey. So, again, it's all about, it needs to be about revenue. You know, as much as we all want to be about the art itself, at some point, the bills have to be paid. Um, the, the high point for music revenue was in 1999. Uh, everyone was buying CDs. It was uh, now that's industry revenue. That's not necessarily artist revenue. Uh, two very different things there. Um, but uh, I think the number I have here is that uh, streaming revenue grew 34 percent year on year. Um, so how can this be a revenue stream in itself? Of course, it will feed into the artist's recognition, the ability to sell tickets to shows, uh, things like that. But is there a model? that we move to, uh, you know, obviously, that, or we could move to, where streaming is a, is a revenue source that is, uh, that maybe goes towards replacing that CD or album revenue over time, or has that time gone? Well, I think there are artists already that live off streaming, like you have, um, I mean, like a rapper from Toronto, Daniel Caesar, like, he's, like his songs have like 250 million streams only on Spotify, you have Apple, Deezer, so like, He's probably living off that, but I think for most people, um, the important, like the most important thing, is trying to hit everything you can. So we're very lucky to have uh, a great grant system in Canada. So like exploit that to the fullest for sure, because that could be your number one revenue is grants. Yeah. <laughs> and then on top of that, you have a streaming revenue, and it's going to get more and more interesting. And maybe you still sell some LPs and CDs. Maybe you have a few syncs 
um, sound exchange, serious plays like CDC generates sound exchange. So putting so putting all of that together um, is usually your best shot at um, making a living off it. Yeah, I mean, um, merch, merch is another way. Like artists now more than ever, I think we're called to be more um, entrepreneurial in the way we go about things, or at least have a team of people um, that can inform, or that can like pick up where you might slack. If it's not your strong point, then find somebody. Else. So like the uh, the need to work collectively with other people. If you have more people putting in work and getting things done, then you reap what you sow. Essentially, so more people are doing things, you're gonna be able to get more money back. Like you mentioned with um, if you're working with a label and you're willing to give up some like some money to earn more, then you win at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, shows definitely multiple streams of revenue. It's not just going to come from one source, and that's ultimately where it is. Um, what I think about is the future of streaming services. Do streaming services become the new labels? We, the, on the last panel, um, it was mentioned about uh, Spotify even creating music and creating their own catalogs. That's a little bit scary, but the ulti ultimately, as artists, I don't believe that uh, an AI can replicate what we do. There is something that resonates differently as a human being creating music. And whether it's me, like myself, I consider my voice an instrument, so I am an instrument. Um, whether you have, whether you're playing the saxophone or if you're a pianist, whatever the case may be, um, that really can't be replicated. And I feel like people will buy that. You just have to be creative in the way you go about exploring um, the different revenue streams. That's a big part of it, I think, is what you just said is where are those revenue? It's not just one revenue stream. So, is streaming revenue? Well, if, if I was talking at like pop explosion or something, I'm like, yeah, it's it's a thing that you can look at. When I'm talking with with jazz artists, it's a different thing. What the streaming is just part of a parcel of different things that you're putting together. Because, like for you know, just for an example, last night um, I went when I got back to my hotel room, I was listening to some music on Spotify. Um, checking out an artist who I didn't really know their stuff, but I knew was a very major name in jazz. And they had played, you know, they put their popular songs. So you get to see actual how many plays this song has had. And so the most popular song was not the artist's own music, it was playing with the singer. And then, oh, there's a quarter of a million hits on that song. So that singer's doing, hopefully it's their own song, they're doing okay. Um, they they've made, might have made Fourteen to sixteen hundred dollars. Uh, so, uh, whereas this artist's number one play on their own album of their own music was forty five hundred, which for jazz artists um, is neither horrible nor amazing. It's okay, okay. That means you exist and you're you're doing okay. But the reality is that's twenty seven dollars worth of, of royalties. So, is that going to pay for them when they're on tour? Is that going to pay? No. Um, but it is one, because everything's spread out now. Like it used to be, okay, we had uh, people who were curating everything into small channels. So we talked about newspapers. Everything was there. People went to newspapers. That's where everyone read the same things. We talk about uh, record companies in you know, the, the peak in the 90s where they're curating. So there's, the, the joke is, you know, there was 100 artists making millions of dollars. Now there's millions of artists making hundreds of dollars. It is somewhat true, but it's spread out more. There's more different places. Like, for example, we talk about different streaming platforms. Spotify is the, the major one, so we talk about that, that in Apple Music, where they own the lion's share of what's going on, and they're paying out between 0 0.003 cents per play to, if you're really lucky, 0 0.008. And here's the funny thing. Napster, who is the pirates, they're the highest paying 
uh, streaming service. You want to be streamed on Napster because that's where you're going to make the most money. Go figure. Um, what is Napster though? <laughs> well, apparently, this is the thing though. You you would be surprised. There's something yeah. like four or five percent of the market. We always think about okay, well, Spotify, Apple, but there's as you know, there's a series of of other players which are catering to different um, personalities and tastes. And like we talk about Bandcamp, you know, that's where that's an artist saying, I want. I want to, I, I'm, most artists that are there, I think it was somewhat in, originally in a reaction to the streaming model, where we're saying, okay, we go there, and that money's coming to us as an artist. And there are people, like myself, when I purchase music, I will purchase it, if I'm going to purchase I'm going to go through a spot where I feel like more of that money is going to make it to the creator. And as a label, that's how we function too. You know, there are different label deals, like you talk about streaming. It's, you know, okay, there's the retail value of your 9.99 subscription, of which Spotify takes, uh, what is it, it's 37%. Then that 65% left over goes to the label, of which then, if you're in a traditional label deal, maybe anywhere between 8 and 25% of the remainder goes to you. So it's, it's also looking at those and saying, okay, what am I willing to accept? Where in I as an artist now can I I can step in directly and run my own uh, catalog? Do I need to be with a label, or if I am, what are they bringing? What are they doing? You know, as a label, I can say that. Um, so it's you know those are a lot of different things to think about. Like to me, it's such a big topic. I'm like I could talk for hours, but I'm going to stop now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to just add to kind of what you guys all addressed in the last question as well about how I mean to me anyway. Uh, I think streaming is more of a springboard to get audience and listeners to find kind of like your brand and your image and whether they want to follow you. And I find that the people who have followed me, they're like following me consistently. So the music has kind of just led to that. Um, and I think what I feel like what the model is going to be is kind of a reversal back to um, like the days of Bach and Mozart where there's like patrons of the arts who really... Um, endorsed and sponsored and, and helped fund all these creations of incredible music and, and compositions and stuff. And I think it's kind of going that way. I mean, with the rise of like uh, Patreon or Patreon, I don't know how to pronounce yep. it, yep. and types of websites like that. And I noticed, um, I think, I may be mistaken, but somebody like Jacob Collier, for example, I think he has quite a significant Patreon or Patreon following where artists are offering like very specific um, features or giveaways or content um, for a fee which like diehard fans who are really willing to buy in and follow this artist through different projects and different stages of their um, creative development, they're willing to pay a subscription fee, which I'm sure with the collective amount of listeners he has, uh, just as an example, um, could really help you know, subsidize and fund other projects as well. So I, I'm actually kind of interested to go that route. I haven't yet pursued that, but it's something I'm, I'm willing to um, look into in more depth. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, because even outside of jazz and music as a whole, uh, there's lots of YouTube channels that survive, and people who do very well on that. Now, again, there's always that, that one or two very high earners, mm -hmm. um, but maybe that is part of what the audience is going to start being comfortable with doing, is saying with micropayments, I like that track, I'll give you a dollar. You know, and, and that might not, uh, you know, if it's it's got to be a momentum thing that takes those things in, but we, I think you do see those yeah. those types of changes. Um, and as a whole, um, yes, Spotify, Apple, and, and um, Amazon are the top top three with about 60%, but maybe there is, you mentioned uh, Napster, which was, I think, the rename of, of, of Rhapsody, is it? Napster, Pandora, Amazon, Deezer, like it goes yeah. on, there's, yeah. there's lots. So maybe there's a, maybe it's a moving, a moving target while maintaining a connection out to your audience. Like that. So now we talked about potentials of revenue. I mean, one thing that I've looked at some of the numbers here, and again, I'm a bit more from the technology numbers side, um, and it was interesting to see that uh, from a streaming perspective, Latin America has led in growth with about 20% um, for the last four consecutive years. So does this, you, you mentioned, Cody, about uh, an artist who uh, who found his message about Germany? Um, does this um, the streaming really allow you to go out and find those new markets? How does someone go around doing those things? Yeah, you, do, you can. I think on Spotify there's like a pro artist uh, version you can get. There's, you know, we look at Google <coughs> Analytics, like easiest thing to sign up with through Facebook, and 
you know, all your social media stuff. It's it's all very much there. And then, yeah, you can look at markets that are more streaming oriented. Like even just in Canada, we can look and say um, the most streaming oriented uh, province. Anyone guess? Nova Scotia. Uh, the least British Columbia. And, you know, I wouldn't have thought British BC was the least. I thought it would be fairly on top of that. But you know, different parts of the country have different. Uh, ways of consuming and different models and thoughts about how to do it, and, but you can you can follow metrics. You know, if you you spend ten minutes online looking at how to find the metrics for different platforms, it's all there. They want you to find it. They want you to use it, and they want you to be involved. And they want more people coming to find your music. Now, obviously, there's you know there's the true stat that ten percent of streaming accounts for ninety percent of of uh, revenues. You know, so the the Kanye West and the Taylor Swifts of the world there. They're, and that's the reason why when I say the, the record industry is not dying, it's shifting. Because those labels are making more money. There's, and this is the thing. This is kind of what music was doing um, with you know everyone's oh no, pirate, with, through the piracy era. And then once these streaming sites which came out of piracy, like the CEO of uh, Spotify ran uTorrent, yes. where you download free movies. So, you know, but what happened is now it's like an oligopoly, right? Where all of these streaming services, they're like, we want to make money. We want to bring in income. So what you're seeing is there was a dip, and then since about 2012, it's been doing this, and like he says, about 30, 35% a year. We are watching physical sales go down about 25% a year. Um, but that's a, that's a whole different thing. But the streaming services want, want people there subscribing so that they can get that large chunk of your earnings. And, and that's a whole other thing where we're talking about arts advocacy, is, is advocating within that as arts groups, talking about, you know, for example, TV shows paying less, wanting to just pay a flat, a flat fee rather than licensing fee, fees. The same thing's happening in Spotify. Um, it was Spotify and Amazon and uh, Pandora had all done a legal uh, protest against uh, songwriters uh, having an agreed bump in the rates. These things are happening. So as artists, we still have to be extremely vigilant, more so, I think, than ever, as far as fighting these companies saying, how much more can we take and how much less can we give? But, you know, it's they want the money. We want to drive people to platforms to get our music. We can't get rid of them. So it's, it's how do you work with Augment and then advocate in a way that it's at least, you know, we have some voice in it. So uh, a lot of, there is revenue, the increase in the industry, again, as an industry rather than as the artist, 10% uh, year on year growth of uh, revenue, uh, which is great. Is there a way that artists as a collective can change the way these large organizations work? I mean, is that even possible or is it, uh, uh, is that, is that model going uh, By large organization, you mean, uh the the Apples, Googles, okay. you know, well, yeah, for sure. There's a great organization called Merlin that represents uh, most of all independent labels. Um, they are basically negotiating at the table. They're an entity. So you basically have like uh, Universal, Sony, Warner, um, that all like can negotiate deals with those DSPs, and then you have Merlin that acts for uh, most of the prominent independent labels in the world. So they are very transparent, and they will pay you back almost 96% of what's coming in. And they basically just take it. And then advocating with government, you know, a lot of, it seems like a big thing to say, but, you know, we have that opportunity. We're in Ottawa today. There are people here you can actually meet with that will, because you're a constituent, sit with you and talk with you and listen to your concern. And you'd be surprised how few individuals or smaller artist organizations companies do that you can actually go talk to your representative and the funny thing is by being the one person who's talked to them they're like hey i've got something i can i think people want and, and that's you know what politicians do is uh, if they think it's beneficial for their career they'll help you out but you go out there and you try and, and you advocate and there are there are some politicians too i know a lot of people won't believe me on this who actually do want to do good and so you, you try and find them and, and help advocate on your behalf. Well, I certainly think probably you know, Canada Council of the Arts that has uh, sponsored this event 
is doing is to understand the, that um, that model and the needs of artists and, and things like that. Is it frustrating as an artist to to uh, um, you know to see a model that maybe you don't have as much direct control about? I mean, maybe. Which will count as counsel? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'd say this would be a good answer over here. Either piece. Well, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a thing. Thing. yeah. Yeah, I think that um, you mentioned something, Andrew, that was key. And understanding art and then industry or infrastructure. And um, jazz as a musical practice is has a lot more infrastructure. Therefore, I think that's the reason why it's a little bit more difficult to see how you can embrace what's new because this old model has worked for so long. Yeah. And I think there lies an opportunity there for jazz to learn from punk and to learn from hip hop. Um, I think outside the box a little bit. It's, um, it's, it's not scary. You know, it's yeah. it's just new, and there's an opportunity to, opportunity to expand with that. Um, I think uh, Canada Council is on the right track. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think investing in innovation, innovative ways, um, learning from what we're doing with hip hop, learning what from what punk has been doing forever. Um, yeah. Make Does that make question? your own change. Yeah, and work with folks that are willing to work with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, if you want to be a part of like a larger engine, just understand there's going to be certain trade-offs that you have to make, and that's it, you can't you can't um have your cake and eat it. You can't maintain full control, but then have other people feel involved at the same time, or like. Uh, you gotta cede some sort of control if you wanna do more. Yep. It's like, what, what do they say? Um, if you wanna go far, go. No, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go with the team or go with you. That's good. So, um, you gotta think outside the box and yeah. think how you can include other people. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's the question? Are we? Do we feel overwhelmed by the. I, I, what, what do we think those, those steps are? I mean, maybe just as a couple of artists, do you feel those things? That you're going against a large organization. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or an industry, do you feel the industry meets that, comes back to you a, a, as a whole? Well, and I, I, mean, I mean more yeah. maybe the streaming industry rather right, than... Right, right, right. Well, I, yeah, I think I would probably just reiterate what I said. I think, I, again, like I, I feel in my case, I just use the streaming platforms as a means to reach other people. I don't expect to make any money from that at all at this point. Um, uh, but there's something Rosie said now, and I can't remember what it was. Um, oh, but I think now more than ever, because so much of, like, in terms of social media and the tools we have at our fingertips that are, you know, free to use, um, uh, people more than ever now have ways to do whatever they feel. Like, it's a lot more of, like, out-of-the-box kind of thinking to reach your audience and to maybe stream your music or then maybe to come to a show or like any other way to connect with you which I don't think is exclusive through streaming anymore or, or just listening to your music I think it's about like the bigger picture and do they do people feel like they relate to you as a person and you know what your image is and all that stuff so I think it's like very broader than that now um, but it's enabled people now to express themselves differently online and hopefully reach you know different types of people so we talked about streaming as being a way of connecting to audiences that will connect into us at shows, through other uh, medias. Maybe there's an opportunity for some revenue there. Might not be as big a piece of the pie as we all want, um, but it might be there. So let's look at streaming from the third perspective, which is the future. Um, I can go and watch a Met Opera in a cinema. Um, I can put on my VR goggles. Uh, maybe participate in a show that's not on my continent or something like that. Is that a reality for streaming? How do we see that from an artist's label perspective? Is that something that uh, has any potential or is that sci-fi at this stage? It's happening now. Yeah. It's not sci-fi. It's, it's real. Like, you know, I'm, 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 things like this, you, you'll see them on Facebook Live all the time. Where, you know, when you're in a concert, there's, there's artists encouraging their, their audience, you know, post stuff on Instagram, put stuff up onto, you know, they're putting up their own things on YouTube, and it's, 
It's, it is what it, it's. I think what's happening is we're going to see um, maybe a, a refinement or a improvement on places. Once again, as music, we always talk. How do we monetize this? So you, you'll see more and more platforms come up that allow you to do that to have your you know, micro payments, that type of thing, to, to, to broadcast. Because people want, like for example, I was at a talk that um, Braxton Cook was talking about, a uh, sax player, talking about, um, he was very successful on social media, and, and talking about little things, like he found that by playing, you know, just posting himself practicing or, or jamming, those were his highest hit videos. So seeing things like that, understanding as an artist, well, if I start doing that, okay, if I can get micro payments on that, maybe that, it kind of helps, or I get subscribers to my site, or things like that. We're, we just haven't seen as much subscription into individuals. We see a subscription into large organizations, but you know the tools are coming, and they're probably already here to, to create that subscription into, you know, I could subscribe to Allison, or I could subscribe to Rosie, and just, and, and depending on what content they're putting out, I can pay them. Oh, do we feel, I mean, would that be something that as artists we would consider? I mean, is that something that, that, that it's uh, having the camera, the professional cameras there, a specific way of streaming? How would that interest you, Alison? Yeah, well, um, maybe not exactly about that per se, but I, I was just speaking, my wife and I were talking about the fi the new 5G network that's currently, uh, yep. I don't know if it's out or whatever. The Almost. Phrases. Yeah, but we were talking about how you could potentially jam with someone across the, the world and the latency is relatively low or much better, you know, than um, it currently is. So yeah, I mean, that you could be doing live sessions with people and not ever have to leave your house or collaborate with people um, on a, in another country um, live, you know, in that kind of context. So um, I think that's kind of exciting. It's certainly different and I can't envision that exactly, but I think that would be something worth um, exploring and seeing how that goes. You know, yeah. new ways to create. Yes. I feel like you can meet somebody online, start a relationship, and then go meet them in person as well. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, can you give me the question again? Well, I mean, just the, these these online uh, or real time mass streaming events, broadcast events online. Oh. Just, you know, is that. But will you imagine, I mean, obviously having an audience there right in front of you is one thing, but if that was a, a camera, is yeah. that the same? Oh, it's not the it's same. It's not the same, sorry, not the same, but is it, how does it have the impact? It's another way, it's a different avenue, it's not the same at all, but yeah, be, like I watched a um, festival last month that was happening in Ghana, it was called um, Afro Nation, it was like a huge festival, but I watched it on on my phone. And I wanted to be there. It would have been amazing to be there, but I still got to experience it. And those same artists now have me as a viewer w way here and over here in Canada. So if they come to Toronto, you'll, you'll buy a ticket. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think you have to look at the way that the world is shifting and where the world is going overall, because yeah. music, being an artist, is just it's part and parcel of that. We, do, we don't exist in a bubble. So we are becoming more interconnected, for better, for worse. I think it's how we use it, what we do with it. Um, and that's just a part of it. So yeah, having, if, if that's what the t where the taste goes, having virtual concerts or virtual experiences of music that is not necessarily a person playing or you playing in front of other people, that's what people wanna, that's how we continue music, that's where it goes. Yeah, I think it works. Okay, any other questions? Any other thoughts from the panel on streaming? We're going to open up for questions in a moment. If has I mean, I, <clears throat> one thing we didn't really touch on is there's, a, there's genres that are doing very well that people maybe don't think about. Like classical music is huge on Spotify. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they do very well. Like ambient music is huge. You have all those peaceful pianos with songs to fall asleep to and stuff like that. So there's genres of people, like it's not only pop music or hip hop that does well, it's very wide. And there's a lot of curated jazz playlists on all of those platforms also. 
and they're very, um, it's, it's very possible to be on there. One, the one thing that we didn't really touch on is how, how streaming might affect the actual art itself. And that is a, that's actually a real consideration. One of the uh, little fun facts is, for example, in the U.S. right now, there um, there's a bunch of stations on the pop side of things that because of studies that they're seeing through analytics, the average attention span is two minutes for a song. So there are, there are actual stations that exist only to play two-minute versions of songs. So mm -hmm. as artists, the, or, the, or the reality that, you know, like when we talk about jazz, it might take a minute or two minutes before we even get to the melody, before we get through the, you know, just welcome to the song, welcome to this world. Um, whereas now the reality is in art is if, okay, if your goal is to succeed in streaming, um, then you have to make these decisions. Okay, well, am I going to put in a, a two-bar intro instead of that two-minute beautiful thing we did? Um, you know, understanding the whole concept of tune-out moments in music, which is a big thing at CBC. They, they talked about it within their own broadcasting, where, you know, hey, no, in jazz, no drummer bass solos on certain shows. Otherwise, people turn, they go to a different channel. And it's, it's, it's as an artist, understanding, okay, there are certain things you can do to succeed on streaming, but then there's also certain choices that you have to really consider from the viewpoint of being a creator, saying, do I agree with that? Do I jive with that? We're going to see a lot more music doing that, um, just because it's the, the nature of it. But I think, you know, it's something as creators, it's very important to be aware. You have to make choices um, which are either, you know, congruent with your beliefs or not. And I feel as soon as you step outside of your belief system as an artist, you're not really an artist anymore. Okay, so maybe from the audience, are there any questions? Thanks for this. Um, I think this was touched on a little bit, but maybe not explicitly said. I think, Jason, you sort of mentioned it, but the, the product has to be good. <laughs> um, and I know from, uh, as a festival artistic director, streaming is an enormous tool for me for research and finding out about artists. But it's only, it's a thing that will then take me to that artist's website or maybe that artist's social media page and everything like that. And if at any step of the way, it's the quality disappears, um, I'm going to be really turned off. So, Allison, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm kind of going to put you on the spot. Um, I, think you, I think you already have. Only, only because we're both from Trump. Um, I feel like the way you've approached it, your career, um, has been sort of grassroots in that way. Like, you haven't... You know, no one's come along and plucked Allison now and said, this is the next best thing in jazz or anything. Like, you've worked really hard, and everything that you've done has been really high quality from terms oh, of the recording you. and the presentations, any of the video that I've seen online and everything like that. So I wondered if you could just sort of talk us through some of the decisions you've made since maybe even getting out of school in terms of, you know, how you wanted to approach what you do and get to where you are now. Well, thanks, Josh. That's really kind. <laughs> I'm very flattered. Um, speak to what, okay, so in terms of like content specifically, I guess? Or decisions about how you promoted yourself or... Oh, uh, okay. Well, I don't think I'm very good at social media and I know that's like the biggest tool for everybody now and specifically my generation because that's what we've come up using and having access to immediately. Um, I just tell myself, because um, I know social media is a what's the word, like a whirlpool of self-doubt and self-deprecation and uh, excitement. It's finding inspiring pages and stuff, of course. Um, I think you have to do what feels authentic to you. And um, I've often considered like, oh, that person, like, they have more followers, I should do that. But if I, if I don't feel like it's genuine to me, I can't do it. So I kind of just let that guide my way. Um, and musically too, like I, I found luckily a group of people I, I love to collaborate with and I trust their opinions and I feel like um, musically we, it's very collaborative in that way and I trust my band members to help me make decisions as to even like so far as um, curating the music that actually goes on the album in that way. So that's very much a group effort. And then in terms of um, uh, social outreach, that's really just I'm on my own for that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I don't know. I think I just really try to figure out, like, does that feel like I would do that in person? 
you know, and try to match that with my personality in some way. Um, like the latest campaign I did on Instagram was about my family history. I was promoting a show. It was like leading up to a, a concert I had last Saturday. Um, and the theme happened to lend itself well to the way I was going to try to promote, you know, the, the concert anyway. But that was something that really resonated with me. And, and for those of you who don't know, just really quickly, I just shared um, historical photos of my, grand, my grandparents and my parents and how they came to Canada. The concert I did was kind of themed on migrations and how people move. Um, but I got a lot of response from posting these photos and just telling a story that is part of my family history. So I, in that way, I just tried to find something that was honest and unique. So I guess for people listening, like if there's something that you feel is unique to you, like how can you use that in, a, in an authentic way that can kind of connect with your art in some way? Um, so telling a story in that context. But I mean, just to answer your question, I guess, I'm, I'm not sure what I do. I think I talk to my bandmates a lot about decisions we do gigs-wise content, what video, like the videos maybe that you've seen, the live videos, we talk a lot about that. It's very collaborative in that way. So um, I don't feel like I make a lot of those decisions independently. I think it's like a lot of discussion and making sure everyone's comfortable and we just do things that feel right for everybody. So I'm always um, talking to people in my process. So I don't know if that answers the question, but... Can I say as another booker who uh, I can, I can, yeah, I can say from the point of view of with Allison a couple of years ago um, through Jazz Festival Canada, the quality of what she was doing, that became a conversation as to why you know everyone wanted to have you, oh, you. tour tour the country because mm -hmm. you hadn't you hadn't even applied, but the, no. your stuff was there. We knew about you, and everyone was like, we there there are moments where people you know make a decision. Why aren't they not touring? Like, can we help? So promoters and, and you know. Artistic directors will do that. They'll if they find something that's really engaging and like I was following that Instagram story. Oh, it's delightful, um, <laughs> but it's a story, and that's one of the key things that that with our with our artists we try is story. You know, do you, especially if nobody knows who you are, especially you need to craft a story that engages somebody. It needs to be an authentic story, you know? Like, for example, we had an artist who was Juno-nominated at 79 years old with his first album, because that was the story. People were fascinated with the fact, 79, what gives? Why did, why did that long for a new album? Um, you know, things like that, where you take these little ideas that you've, you've got brewing, like, you know, you're doing migrations and finding the story to connect. People want stories. It's the same idea when you're at a concert, you know, when we talk about merchandise and all this going down. People still do buy CDs, even if they don't have CD players. The reason mostly is because they loved the experience, the story, and they want to take something home. And that's why you'll be like, oh, geez, I didn't bring CDs tonight. Why did people not stream my music after? Because you have them in the moment, and they wanted something now. They want it there. They, they, they're like, you got me. I'm involved. I will buy this coaster. I will buy that shirt. I will, I will, I will add you. Hey, someone on stage actually said, yeah, I'm on Spotify. Check your playlist. Feel free, right? And you'll see people pull their phones up. And they'll do it right there and then. It's, it's an immediacy. It's like grabbing it, creating a story, grabbing the audience right in the moment. And the internet, more than anything, is allowing us to do that. Any other, other questions? Hi there. Um, so I just had a quick question. Um, we're talking about social media, but back to streaming. Um, most of the young artists that I talk to who are on streaming, uh, they're a little overwhelmed by what they could do. Um, obviously, social media is a separate discussion. But if you're if you're a, an independent artist who's starting out on streaming, if you had an hour a day to dedicate to developing your audience, what would you do? If you were a piano player learning how to play piano, how much would you practice? It's uh, to me that's the same thing. You know, like how are you going to become a great player? Um, you need to work on it every day. Pick one thing. You know, hey, here's my B flat major scale. Just pick that item. Okay, I'm going to learn today about Spotify metrics. I'm going to I'm going to look at this and really get into it. It's just to me anything in life. It's the same process as becoming a musician. Just focus on it and work on it and work on it regularly so that it becomes something in your repertoire that you get 
and this is where you start running into people who have expertise in things. It's the same as playing. They find that item and they do it. I think it comes down to understanding people. And as an artist, it's such a surreal experience and like in telling our own stories, um, you see how it connects to other people. So when I'm learning about okay how to find an audience or how to connect with people who are going to resonate with my story, I try to be as authentic as possible. Um, even though it's vulnerable, it's very vulnerable to share like personal stories. Um, I think that's what kind of draws people in for sure. So a lot of studying I do I do is like how do I communicate that? How do I resonate with people? And it it's kind of like a roundabout way and how it connects back. But I feel like maybe that's just the way I learn. You know, that's the way I process things. So it's like the more I learn about myself, the more I learn about other people, um, how to tell stories. Um, I don't know. It's it, it makes sense in here. <laughs> I, I, I think that's a good point because the web is, as we say, a web, and it's very easy for people to become distracted. So what's that hook, the story, and maybe it's an image, maybe it's a message, maybe it's tying into something that says stop, pause, spend that 10 seconds to become engaged, and then hopefully you've got that customer, that, that potential patron um, being hooked in. Well, I think also like preparing to like release a record is a part of it, and there's great tools online. I mean, there's Spotify for Artists is available for everyone. There's a pitch tool in there where you could submit uh, upcoming releases. So um, you try to ingest your music a couple weeks in advance. Um, you can actually like pick your genre, write a little blurb about why they should care what the song's about, and have, have it pitched to basically your genre and it should reach the curators uh, of those playlists so that's one thing that they've done that's pretty cool and then also there's a lot of tools and uh, blog posts on there um, to help you navigate their platform there's also like all of the south by southwest uh, panels are all online like with music experts and like artists um, that talk about that so there's a lot of resources for sure but i truly truly think that it, it ties back to like having that organic reach and making enough noise uh, locally, then maybe nationally, and then just trying to grow from there. And I really believe that that's the way to go. Uh, before, like trying, it's almost impossible to like just break out on streaming, you know? Like it's, it, there's so much more attached to it. It's, it's still like you need a real, to build a career and it'll get there at some point for sure but it is challenging being an independent artist on your own trying to navigate all of that but just doing the right things and having a good presence online and good quality material hopefully with time you'll get there okay so uh again thank you everyone um today thank you to uh, allison cody rosie and Jason for uh, participating today. I want to one final thought. Uh, just bear in mind that as of today, um, YouTube is still less than 15 years old. So this is an industry that is uh, that is evolving at light speed. Um, that is going to change. This time next year, there'll be a whole new set of technologies, whether it's 5G, uh, in-home, uh, self-driving cars, so I can sit there and browse the catalog while the car goes down the highway. I'm not ready for that yet. Um, but uh, it is going to be a fast changing, so I do appreciate your time at the panel today. Uh, and in fact, that concludes the, uh, the fourth panel of this uh, series. So we want to thank the Canada Council for the Arts for uh, sponsoring this and for the uh, staff and uh, volunteers at the Jazz Festival for uh, enabling this to be put on and all of our panelists as well.